Lovely, thank you very much. So uh, my name is Ilka Turnen uh, and I'm the Global Director of Solutions Architecture at Sonatype. So uh, at Sonatype, I deal with uh, software supply chain attacks uh, all day long. You know, uh, kind of com coming into uh, Simon's uh, talk just uh, before myself, um, the software supply chain attack is all about influencing the code that you don't own, yet the stuff that you use in your software. It's kind of been a mode of attack that, you know, I think we've all in the DevSecOps uh, sphere been talking about, uh, uh, talking about for years and years and years. But uh, just as our practices evolve, the mode of the attack, the software supply chain attack itself, evolves. So what I thought I'd do uh, in this uh, 15 minutes, uh, 15 minutes is walk you through the evolution of this software supply chain type of attack and just kind of walk you through the strategies of uh, defending against each uh, and every one of them. So we all know software has it in the world. It's 2020 now, you know, a couple of world changing events later, here we are. Um, uh, that line was spoken uh, in 2010 by Mark Anderson, but uh, looking at it, uh, looking at it with uh, 10 years of hindsight, uh, one of the main culprits was open source. Uh, as Simon mentioned, you know, depending on the programming language, depending on the ecosystem, uh, various different types of uh, software nowadays are mostly open source. About depending on what report you read, you can say that about eight, 75 to 90 percent of your uh, application is actually not your own. It's either libraries, libraries that you use, libraries of those libraries, the transitive dependencies that you pulled in, or uh, or the uh, uh, containers that you run them in, the operating system packages that you have them in as well. Uh, open source helps us do our job. That's why you use it, right? But uh, just with uh, any revolution, uh, uh, any change come with it comes with its own risks, right? The software supply chain attack has really been, you know, depending on who you talk to, uh, the kind of chosen uh, chosen form of attack uh, in the uh, cybersecurity industry over the last couple of years, um, uh, and its many forms uh, are now behind many of the uh, many of the bigger uh, exploitations that you see out there on the internet. So, um, so, uh, so I'm, uh, I want to go through a few of these just to kind of walk you through what they mean. So um, let's start with the basic uh, software supply chain attack that was uh, just demonstrated uh, just before myself, right? That is uh, real, uh, that is using known security vulnerabilities in these open source components and betting that you as a developer forget to update uh, those dependencies, right? Um, uh, and it, it makes a ton of sense, right? You know, as uh, uh, as mentioned, if, if eighty to ninety percent of your code is open source, what that really means is that about um, uh, is that um, in a typical Java project, you have about a hundred to uh, 110 uh, different open source projects on average. In the Java world, especially when we're starting to use uh, uh, libraries uh, libraries to uh, boilerplate our projects, we're talking about three to 400 modules very, very easily per project. Anyone who's ever looked into the node module directory probably knows this joke uh, for, for many, many years, right? And it all started uh, many, many years ago. This type of attack is actually a lot older and a lot more impactful a lot earlier than we think. Right. Uh, one of the first kind of proper examples of this type of attack of finding a known vulnerability and finding software that uses that particular dependency uh, actually comes from 2015 with a com component called, called Commons Collections. That is, as the name suggests, a very common uh, piece of open source. Uh, it's used for deserialization. And wh what happened was uh, it contained a vulnerability that allowed you to, just like uh, just like in the previous examples, run your own code. Now, what's interesting about this, though, is it's very, very popular. It's, it's on fairly many websites. And um, in 2015, when they logged a new security vulnerability against it, um, uh, we saw that um, that vulnerability was actively used against the campaign. That was really what made the name for software supply chain attacks. It also had a huge, huge impact. For example, it closed the Hollywood Presbyterian Hospital uh, in Los Angeles um, uh, uh, for a while because someone used this particular component to install uh, ransomware on their computers. What's more interesting is my employer, Sonatype, uh, sponsoring this talk, actually run Maven Central. So we get to see the patterns of people downloading open source and using them. And when we looked at it a year later, we saw that about 80% of all the downloads of this particular component were still against that known uh, vulnerable version. Well, another good example of this type of attack is actually the one that made software supply chain 
uh, a thing. It's the uh, 2017 Struts to Remote Code Execution vulnerability. This is an interesting story because, uh, you know, and I'm sure anyone in this circle has heard it many times, but what's interesting about it isn't that there was an open source component and it was very popular and had a security vulnerability. It's that it's the timeline of it. Um, what ended up happening was uh, since uh, since it was discovered um, uh, within a day of it coming out, so March the 17th, 2017, the Apache project logged a new security vulnerability um, uh, under the uh, uh, under the Struts project. Um, they released a fixed version. They released a notice to everybody saying, "Hey, this is now a thing." Um, what ended up happening, though, is the very next day, the National uh, Security uh, Agency of the U.S. Uh, found that Pentagon scanners themselves were seeing uh, uh, other nation states looking, uh, poking around the Internet for servers uh, with this um, uh, vulnerable struts instance, trying to run the, this exploitation code. That On the same day, uh, uh, exploitation code of that particular security vulnerability was published onto ExploitDB. There was also a POC on GitHub. And uh, on the second day, March the 9th, Cisco actually or later reported that they saw a huge number of exploitation events running through networks, just packages blindly trying to see servers with this. On March the 10th, uh, several well-known uh, names uh, got exploited by uh, this particular security vulnerability, Equifax being one of the better known ones. And you know, three years later, we all know that that was one of the biggest uh, uh, data leaks uh, of the uh, decade. But what was well less known is uh, there were several other victims, including the Canadian Revenue Agency, the Okinawa Power, agency in Japan, the Audar system in India. Um, and using that particular component, we still saw several different types of iterations of the same attack, not even against newer versions of that vulnerability, but the exact same vulnerability. For example, in December 19, 2017, there were crypto mining campaigns. And even today, when we look at the stats and we look at uh, how often this particular version uh, of uh, Struts is downloaded, we see that about 65% of the uh, population still goes for these older, more vulnerable versions. So again, it's a type of attack that preys on the fact that you as a developer are not remembering to go in and update your dependencies. It has, it's a known security vulnerability. It sits there and it's being exploited. But um, one of the things that this kind of a, a mode of attack proved was that uh, was that uh, you can take over uh, the upstream. You don't have to wait for a new security vulnerability to come into play in order to um, in order for uh, you to um, execute a campaign. You can just manufacture one yourself. Probably the most famous example of this happened a year later uh, in November 2018. Uh, it was uh, ex executed against a component called uh, Event Stream, which uh, was compromised. Now this is a this was a pretty clever attack because this is really the first orchestrated campaign against an open source component. So what happened was a, a seemingly been a, 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 a favorable stranger joined the project uh, and started contributing code. Eventually, uh, eventually they got committer rights to that uh, repository. What actually happened was they introduced uh, some particularly obviously malicious code in that uh, in that open source component. Now, everybody noticed that. In fact, I think it took about two hours for that vulnerability to be publicized. But what wasn't publicized was that actually they cleverly hidden another vulnerability uh, in an earlier version. So when the newest, latest version was discovered to be vulnerable, what usually happens is these links get posted on Slack. People are downgraded to um, you know N minus one, and that actually contained a targeted campaign against a crypto mining uh, crypto coin uh, wallet, uh, which then uh, later went in and um, uh, went in and uh, ex uh, snuck away with uh, wallet uh, uh, wallet contents. So uh, this was the beginning uh, beginning of a uh, type of attack where not only are we trying to influence, find open source that's proliferated itself uh, onto your software, we're actually going back to the source and we're trying to influence the code itself. So uh, when you start drawing this out on a map, uh, you actually start seeing a pattern. You know, there's plenty of uh, plenty of attacks and not enough to talk about in 15 minutes. But what you do notice, though, is often these are uh, these are uh, attacks that um, uh, uh, are harbingers of each other. For example, in January 2018, there was a famous Medium article that went around that spoke about uh, harvesting credit card numbers using a bogus JavaScript attack. It was kind of a, a parody uh, that was written. But by the September of the exact same year, that exact mode of attack happened with a small company called uh, Bridge Airways, where uh, one of their uh, one of their uh, JavaScript uh, libraries that was sat on their payment page was poisoned by an external attack um, uh, in in a, in a campaign where it started actually sending credit card numbers away from that payment form. 
So in some ways, uh, the prediction became the harbinger of those types of attacks. And often what we see is when a the type of software supply chain attacks in, occurs in one ecosystem, there's some clever friends looking at it, uh, trying to replicate it elsewhere. So good news is we did evolve defenses. You know, my employer uh, and others uh, came up with tools that help you understand what open source you have, help you bump these versions, give you pull requests, give you uh, banners in GitHub, give you all the badges that you need to tell uh, your community that you've got trouble. But um, uh, but um, so too did the uh, uh, but fundamentally what we ended up doing was automating this for all of your projects. What we really did here we go my final uh, my excellent animation that I'm running here. What we did was really go through each and every one of the components on the list and ask the question, are there known security vulnerabilities on this? Are there known security vulnerabilities on this? Are there known security vulnerabilities on this? Uh, to encourage upgrading. Uh, fundamentally, that's really what all of these kind of go through. But unfortunately, the attack types uh, have evolved as well. They've actually also taken, uh, taken a new form uh, to um, uh, to um, uh, attack you as well. This was described uh, just a couple of weeks ago by, by GitHub, a new, a new type of attack called Octopus Scanner. It's an interesting type of attack because it comes with your with open source or other projects that you might download from GitHub. It infected about 26 uh, dependencies there, but it goes after against a relatively unpopular IDE called NetBeans, which is uh, used in the Java world. Very old uh, for us uh, uh, who have been actually using it. Now, it's an interesting thing because what it does, it actually contains a malicious file called cache.dat, which is injected into your NetBeast project directory. Now, what happens is uh, it actually sneaks itself into the build system. Every time you build code with NetBeans, this cache.dat file contains some code that is executed whilst you build the code. And what it actually happens is it goes ahead and infects all the class files that you're uh, producing and all the nested jars that you generate generate uh, inside of your own project. So he adds its own code into it. Now, this code goes on to live somewhere else and goes on to infect other projects and infect other projects and other projects and other projects, et cetera. And for good measure, it also goes ahead and backdoors your own machine uh, and introduces it into a, into a botnet that can be uh, that can then retrieve and execute some commands from some uh, command and control server somewhere else. Pretty scary stuff. Uh, and it also runs on pretty much everything than, and the kitchen sink. So. Uh, that's the thought that I want to leave you all uh, with today. What you don't no longer need to do is just look at the name. Unfortunately, uh, this attack probably bears the message, uh, type of attack bears the message that in the future, um, in the future, there's going to be other types of attack that leverage target not your own code, but your development environment. Uh, and what you need to be doing is not only looking at known security vulnerabilities and known exploits, but also whether or not your code is 100% open source canonical. Now, there are tools like my employers uh, that can help you do that and identify completely unknown and slightly modified components. But uh, the final uh, thing to understand is controlling that list, unfortunately, uh, no longer is enough. You need to go deeper and find out uh, what is going on uh, with these codes in order to stave these off. It's an it's a interesting future that we're developing, and I'm sure we're going to see many iterations uh, of this going forward uh, as well. So give it a go. Uh, see if, you, if you've got it yourself. Uh, come talk to us on our stand uh, uh, at Sonotype, and uh, we'll be glad to answer any questions for you too.